And now, Brenda Man. Apparently, I need no introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, yes, a um, few of you know me. Uh, I've been speaking for like six years. Uh, who am I? Consultant, yada, yada, yada. I just got my CISSP. Decided to troll ISC squared and had Kevin Mitnick as my actually my first uh, work reference for that. Um, <laughs> that was fun. Um, written some books. I do training and stuff during the day. Um, RenderLab.net's my site. Member of a few groups. Uh, I've been here every year since DEF CON 7, since 1999. There are kids running around that weren't even born when I first started going to DEF CON. I have the scars to prove it. It is scary how many years I've been here. And every year it gets better. You guys make this a friggin' awesome con. Um, I've quit jobs to come down here. It's, there, there's nothing that would stop me. I'm the guy that goes to a, confer uh, a conference in Poland and has this waiting for me. Uh, apparently my reputation precedes me a little bit. So, but first I want to address something. The Kaminsky problem. Over multiple cons, Dan Kaminsky and I are speaking at the same time. I have yet to see him actually speak. This is getting absolutely ridiculous. Uh, in his blog, he actually point, uh, plugs it as the Renderman birthday paradox, which is highly ironic because yesterday was my birthday. <laughs> and I don't think he has any cookies this year, but what the hell? Oh, hell. <laughs> oh, hell. Apparently I get to drink. <laughs> Absolutely no one make a head joke. <laughs> but basically I'm thinking next year, I, um, Basically with Dan, I think we just need to like find a way to really screw with DEF CON and any other con we end up at and speak together at some point and see how they schedule that one. Separate rooms. <laughs> so for this talk, I have to do some ass covering and I have to thank the EFF for uh, vetting this and giving me some suggestions as to what to say. For the love of SpongeBob, do not try anything you're about to see. We're talking about screwing potentially with commercial air traffic control and airliners in flight. This is not a natural tenable position for a human being, you know, 500 miles an hour, six miles above the uh, surface of the earth. Use this information to make air travel safer. Use this to alert people that, gee, maybe there are other systems out there we should be looking at to protect ourselves. Um, think about how this happened and how we can make sure that future systems are built in a more secure manner. Because as you'll see, this is absolutely terrifying stuff. And this happens a lot. We as hackers have a unique insight. We think about things in terms of security. We always think about the outside. We always think about you know, that X factor, that thing that nobody else seem, in the world seems to do. I mean, yesterday you had the chief of the NSA standing up here saying the same thing. Um, don't necessarily agree with everything he said, but the sentiments there. We, as a group, have got to be more involved in the world. So, just for reference, here is the uh, statute out of the United, Sta uh, United States uh, Criminal Code about interfering with air navigation systems, of which basically half the stuff I'm talking about, if you actually did it, would be violating. You're looking at five years in jail and a bunch of fines and all sorts of fun. Um, this talk is kind of weird. I want to be wrong. I want to find out that I am completely wrong about everything I'm about to talk about. I'm not a pilot. I am not an air traffic control operator. Could you imagine me as an air traffic control operator? <laughs> I am in no way associated with air traffic or commercial airlines or anything like that beyond flying cattle class a whole bunch. Um, I'm very good at you know, stuffing people in the overhead bins now. So. Um, if I get some acronym or, or some minor detail wrong, uh, I apologize. There is, you think the computer industry is bad for acronyms? Start reading some of this documentation. It's insane. Um, this research is ongoing and, I, you know, it's, the, the air traffic control system is so huge, there's no way I could talk about everything at, in it or understand it for, you know, it would take me years. Um, but this stuff is 
too important to just keep quiet. So I wanted to point it, all this out now so that I can get other people on board so it's not just you know, all me and a, another handful of, of people. The whole crux of this talk is I want to prove to myself that air travel is still safe, that moving to the next generation air traffic control system does not make things any more dangerous. I'm continually trying to prove this to myself and failing. So I need your help to try to assure myself that this is working. So I get interested in this stuff purely by accident. Bought a program called Plane Finder AR in October of 2010. Some of you may have remembered this uh, program because it was pissing off uh, Homeland Security. And I can't remember which uh, congressman or whatever it was, but uh, basically stood in front of the, uh, uh, on the floor of Congress and said, you know, all these horrible things saying, oh my God, you know, the terrorists can track our airplanes and all this stuff. And it's like, you have absolutely no idea how this works, do you? As, you know, one could say for a lot of things with Congress. Um, essentially what happens is you take your iPhone, you point it at a, a contrail in the sky or, or in, the, in a direction. It, it knows where you are, what direction and angle you've got it pointed at, and you're looking through the camera, and it overlays the flight information where the flight is, which is kind of cool. You know, sitting in an airport and say, like, oh, what flight is, oh, that's one going to Honolulu. Okay, that's kind of neat. You know, I played around with this for a while. Started asking, okay, well, how does this work? Where, where are they getting this information? It can't all be just, you know, downloaded onto the, the phone or something. It requires a, a web lookup. So this led me to sites like planefinder.net, flightradar24, or Radar Virtuel. Essentially what these sites do is they aggregate data from all over the world. Users set up ground stations um, wherever they are and then collect data from flights going over and feed this information into a common database for you know, each of these sites runs uh, uh, off of a different database, but then puts all this stuff into nice you know, Google Maps or flyable uh, uh, maps and you can see you in pretty much real time air traffic. Okay, this is kind of cool. Um, it's about 10 minute delay on that traffic, but still you can see what flights are coming in and out of town. Lots of interesting info. You can query and see, okay, what flight is this? Oh, that's the one to Honolulu. Uh, what kind of plane is that? Oh, 747 owned by these guys. You know, it, there's a huge amount of information there and this is really neat stuff. You know, the, the sort of stuff that just a few years ago was unfeasible to think that we'd have access to. Um, so it all went downhill from there. I've been vastly underemployed for a year, which means I have a lot of free time on my hands. Generally what I say is that when I get bored, bad things happen. Uh, what I have been doing a lot of is speaking. Uh, all over Canada, Europe, US. So I fly a lot. So I'm spending a lot of time at airports, which, you know, considering my background in Wi-Fi, usually ends badly as well. But you, know, you sit around and you're thinking, well, for, you know, at the Las Vegas airport here, you've got a flight landing every 90 seconds. That's an awful lot of metal, money, people moving around. How does this all work? How does this all fit together? You, know, you always hear about air traffic control, but does anybody really know how it works anymore? This is why I should always be employed. Because I start thinking about this stuff. So I did some research. Air traffic control really hasn't changed much since the 1970s. So you know, if you ever watch Airplane, you know, wonderful movie. Um, with the exception of, you know, the comedic elements, it's pretty much like that. Um, primary radar, you know, the big radar dishes you see, you know, rotating on top of the, the conning towers. Um, basically, they just send out a signal, bounces off metal, comes back. That's how you tell where something is. That's what they've been doing since the 1970s. They now have a, uh, whoa, drinks are kicking in. Um, <laughs> They don't have a transponder system, a secondary radar system. So as that radar goes out, it sends out a pulse that the transponder receives and then sends out a signal back with a uh, transponder code as well as altitude information. So previously with uh, primary radar going around, they knew the bearing and approximately the distance of the flight, but they had no idea of altitude. They didn't know anything. All of that was transmitted over voice channel. Now with secondary radar, you at least have some sort of tracking saying, oh, this is American Airlines flight, da 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 da. Um, but there's still a huge amount of work required. There's still a lot of voice communication going back and forth. This interrogation only happens every few seconds. And when you've got something flying 500 miles an hour, its position changes uh, really quickly. So you aren't getting as accurate a picture of what's going on in the sky as you think. 
The pilots get no benefits. Air traffic control knows where they are. The pilots don't. You know, any uh, uh, saying, oh, yeah, you need to, to be careful. There's another flight over here. That all comes back from air traffic control. The pilots are essentially flying blind in a lot of ways. It's kind of scary. This requires that there be a large separation of planes. You can't have planes, you know, riding each other's ass all the way in. You have to maintain a certain level of separation for safety because you don't know, you know, exactly where things are. You know, it could get too close. Bad things could happen. So we're still pretty much running by the seat of our pants. Uh, IVR, which is basically a waypoint-based system, is not optimal. So a lot of airlines are saying, well, we need to improve this because if we're flying point to point to point, it, you know, shortest distance between uh, two points is a straight line. They aren't doing that. They want to be able to do that. It saves gas. You know, you're always hearing about the fuel surcharges and all that crap nowadays. And air travel is increasing. You've got limited capacity. You can't build an airport every five miles kind of situation. You've got cities where, you know, you, you look at the Las Vegas airport here, McCarran, there's only a limited amount of space that you can do there. You can, there's only so much throughput you can put through there. So you need to do everything you possibly can to squeeze everything you can out of there. And then you just get really weird crap, things like weather. There was that volcano a couple of years ago in Iceland, which I am certainly not going to try to pronounce the name of. Th these sort of events can cause havoc all around the world, and those effects in one location can ripple because the entire uh, situation is dependent. A flight leaving Europe landing in the United States is then going to continue on somewhere else. If that plane doesn't arrive, well, it just backs up the whole system. So the decision was made, something needs to change. That change became the next generation air traffic control system. In the late 90s, FAA and others uh, created an initiative to revamp air traffic control in the US and by proxy, essentially the world. They wanted to do more with less, take the existing systems, because the problem is you've got, you know, like, what were some of the numbers? It was almost half of the air fleet is in the air at any given time. So it's not like you can stop all air travel, take it to the, some hangars for a couple of weeks, retrofit everything, and then put it back out. The world would grind to a halt. And that, that would be a bad thing, by the way. So they wanted to modernize this over a period of time, approximately 20 years. Uh, some of the mandates for the uh, this system kick in in 2020. So we've still got lots of time here. They wanted to save costs on air traffic control equipment because big primary radar dishes that spin around on top of towers are very expensive. Um, but at the same time, they also wanted to save fuel for the airlines so they could cut costs, save time, and increase capacity. The key for this is ADSB. This is the data source for the plane finder sites I mentioned and the focus of this talk. And I need a drink. So ADSB is Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. Planes now are now being equipped with GPS to determine their own position. They broadcast that over a 1090 megahertz link, or for smaller planes, uh, 978 megahertz for general aviation, at approximately one hertz, so once a second. So you get a much faster update than you did with primary radar. This information contains the aircraft ID, altitude, position, and latitude and longitude, bearing speed, all that stuff, um, airframe numbers, etc. This is received by a network of ground stations. Now these ground stations are, can be a lot more plentiful because they're a lot cheaper than a big spinning rotating radar dish. Um, this is particularly useful because you can also stick these ground stations on things like offshore oil platforms um, in places like the uh, Gulf of Mexico where there hadn't been primary radar coverage before because you couldn't put a radar dish there. So before it was, oh, plane is entering Gulf of Mexico. We can't track it for you know, a couple hours while it's flying over, and then it pops out the other side. You know, sort of a uh, Bermuda Triangle thing. Uh, but now they can. The early pilots of this were uh, in Alaska, where it's just a very mountainous region, that they needed to know exactly where they were, because on landing, you're basically going through this mountain valley. If you're a couple of hundred feet either side, you're in, you've got problems. Uh, the certainty of location allows flights to be a lot closer. If you know that a flight is here and another flight is here, your, your uh, margin of error is a lot smaller. <laughs> oh, apparently I'm offline. Um, your margin of error is a lot smaller and you can pack 
flights in, which means you can have more flights landing and increase your capacity. This protocol works in two forms. There's ADSB out and ADSB in. So quick graphic here, you can see planes using um, GPS to determine the location, they send a signal down to air traffic control. There's also some interplane communication, which I'll get to, and data coming back from air traffic control to the plane. So it's a lot more data being pushed around than previous systems. Uh, there we go. But when you start looking at the protocol itself, this looks like an awful, like a lot like a network packet, doesn't it? So with ADSB out, this is from the plane out to the world and out to air traffic control. No interrogation needed. This is the automatic part. Okay, that's getting annoying. Um, instead of the primary secondary radar system, uh, planes just report their position via GPS. It's sent omnidirectionally, every direction, to the ground stations and other aircraft that are in the area. Air traffic control scope, you know, used to be the big sweeping arm, you know, going around in the old CRT tubes. That is now replaced digital displays and populated from this information. Uses 1090 megahertz for the commercial stuff, you know, the big 747s, commercial airliners. General aviation uses a, another system on uh, 978 megahertz, uh, UAT. It's a slightly different link format, but effectively it does the same things. So, ADSB in is information flowing into the plane, which is something that's fairly new. It's optional equipment that can be installed in aircraft. Uh, it allows them to, to receive these signals. It's not mandatory, but it's one of those, it's a nice to have, because what it does is it allows planes to be aware of each other with air, without air traffic control intervention. I am just going to say, go away. There we go. So suddenly you have plane to plane communication. You can say, hey, I'm over the Gulf of Mexico, but I know that there's another plane, you know, not far off my uh, starboard side. Starboard? Star I'm not nautical either. <laughs> um, for UAT, for small aircraft that have never had uh, weather radar, they're now able to get weather reports in from air traffic control. So this is awesome if you're flying around in your little Cessna, you can actually know what weather is coming up. You're not having to uh, guess or look at uh, forecasts, which are notoriously not the most accurate thing. The amount of situational awareness increases dramatically. This makes air travel safer. You know exactly where everything is around you. Less chance of collisions, etc. Also works for ground equipment, you know, tra taxiing uh, aircraft, other equipment on the floor ground. It is expensive though. To put these systems into commercial airliners, five to $10,000 for just the broadcast out, up to $20,000 for in, because you got a whole new display panel that needs to be put in. This stuff ain't cheap. General aviation market is getting a lot cheaper. You know, nice little handheld you know, GPS size units are out now. Um, but the problem is for a lot of the testing I was looking at doing, there's not a lot on the used market yet. So this gets to be a bit of a problem. This is as of 1.35 p.m. this afternoon, London. Gee, isn't there a really big event going on in London right now? Just looking at this, do you think it's a good idea that, you know, the average public is able to look at something like this. So the hacker side of my brain took over when I was researching this protocol and how that you know, little app on my phone worked. <laughs> you start looking at these things and you start thinking, well, how, how is this actually being transmitted? Like, what, what does the actual protocol look like? And as I showed you the, the packet there earlier, I couldn't immediately find anything where they had talked about how they mitigate potential threats about this. Every answer seemed to be trust us. Well. I don't trust easily. Previous experience usually means that they either haven't thought of those risks and are trying to cover it up, or they had thought of these risks and were just completely oblivious. I started digger, digging and found out I'm not the only one. ADSB is unencrypted and unauthenticated. Right there, that sound. I love that sound. <laughs> Anyone can listen to 1090 megahertz or. 978 for general aviation, and decode the transmissions from the aircraft in real time. It's a really simple uh, pulse position modulation. You know, it's not a very, they, they want this thing to be very robust they, because 
you know, you get a lightning flash or something like that, you don't want your, your signal scrambled. You want this to just go through. It's really simple stuff. There's no data level authentication of the aircraft. Just a simple checksum. You don't know that it actually came from that aircraft. There is some correlation with primary radar in this hybrid, you know, uh, time as they're, they're transitioning. Um, they're starting to implement multilateration in a lot of cases. I'll get more to that later though. But I'm running a ground station at home, sitting on my desk, little box, mode S beast that uh, records, uh, that uh, soaked to a big like four and a half foot antenna that takes in this ADSB signal from the surrounding area, processes it, uploads it to the internet to some of these sites, uh, and I'm able to look at my own you know, personal virtual air traffic. I'm able to see all the flight paths for the area around my home. And this is actually really interesting because there's times where like at four o'clock in the morning, this flight goes over when the airport's usually closed. I'm like, where the hell is that? You know, log on, able to see, oh, that's you know, a FedEx flight going out to you know, Montreal or something. I'm like, five years ago, the ability for me to check on the air traffic in my area without relying on anybody else, that's nuts. Others have been able to, uh, starting to look at this as well. Ryder Kunkel, uh, DEF CON uh, 17 and 18, uh, did some talks where he briefly alluded to this. He was basically looking at existing air traffic control systems. I'm looking beyond that. Uh, Balance Cyber, Spench.net, has been doing a huge amount of research with uh, software-defined radios and uh, also with ADSB and using those uh, cheap RTL uh, USB TV dongles, uh, using those to actually become ADSB receivers. Uh, USAF uh, Major Donald McKelly, McKelly. Uh, found his graduate research project from a couple of years ago where he was researching this stuff. All of these people so far have not, if you read their work, had not found any mitigations for this. They were just saying, well, there's all these potential threats. Nobody's mitigating this. Nick Foster, uh, SDR radio professional badass, has been uh, doing a bunch of research in this and uh, helped me out a great deal. But really, no one has come up with solid answers as to is this safe or not. Everything's conjecture and hoping and that isn't comforting. Largely a North American problem um, because the FAA has demanded that uh, this be, their order came down, that this be all implemented, that every plane uh, and within certain criteria be equipped by 2020. Europe is waiting until 2030. But this is already being utilized all over the world. Uh, I believe Australia has pretty much already implemented it everywhere. Um, UPS has equipped all of their flights with ADSB out. They were an initial test bed for the FAA. Um, there are planes over our head right now that are ADSB equipped and using this. It's the inevitable direction. We've only got eight years before it's mandatory on this continent that, you know, to uh, ask some of these hard questions as the flying public. I fly a lot and want to get home safely. I am very aware of the irony of talking about attacking next generation air traffic control when I have to fly home. But there's a multitude of threat vectors we need to look at. First threat, ADSB out. So this is plane to air traffic control, eavesdropping. This is simple, you know, as I said, unencrypted, unauthenticated protocols. I'm running a base station. I'm able to record all of this myself. Gee, this is all clear text. Um, what can I data mine with that? I get multiples of these stations. I can do my own homebrew multilateration. Even if a plane is not, is not broadcasting its GPS coordinates, if it's broadcasting anything that I can identify, I can still locate that. You know, Air Force One being a prime example of this. The data mining potential, we know it's in the air, when, where, uh, remember the extraordinary rendition flights from a few years ago where they'd grab a guy in one country, take him to another country to beat the living crap out of him? All of that was uncovered by a bunch of plane spotters who were looking at flights that weren't on normal uh, ch uh, data channels and tracking where they were going. Because essentially in order to play nice in airspace, you have to tell air traffic control who you are. Uh, I highly suggest you stick around for the next talk, um, Busting the Bar because they're talking about uh, this exact sort of stuff where they're data mining this information. Their method um, is a little different than using ADSB, but you augment 
their method with ADSB, and you're going to have a hell of a lot of data to mine. Another obvious attack vector, injection. What is to stop us, other than a very long jail sentence, from injecting ghost flights into air traffic control systems? Documents that discuss uh, using primary radar, you know, actually bouncing signal off metal, uh, that, that talk about fusing that with ADSB in order to verify, okay, this plane says it's here. We actually have metal in the air at roughly that location. We can, you know, kind of trust that. The same documents that talk about using this system also talk about, hey, ADSB is cheap. We can now turn off primary radar. That's scary. Um, what happens if we introduce just slight variations of existing flights? Say, you know, um, start with broadcasting the same location of that flight, but just sort of, you know, make them diverge. How do you know which one's the real one? Generally cause confusion at inopportune moments. You've seen what a snowstorm will do around the holidays at hubs like, you know, New York or uh, Atlanta or wherever. You know, it causes chaos for days. You know, people sleeping in airports and all that. Um, gee, there's an Olympics going on. If you could suddenly introduce a whole bunch of random crap, because air traffic controllers are busy enough as it is. If you throw 50 extra flights in there that they're having to sit down and figure out, okay, what the hell is going on here? These, there's planes now circling. You've now got other, um, you've got things backing up. It's, it's instantaneous. It is scary when you start thinking about the possibilities of this. Could you train the system, create a false signal that goes same time every Tuesday at 2 p.m., this random flight that never responds and is never found to have actually metal there? You know, do that for a few weeks and then, gee, that's where your smuggler's flight goes. There is some discussion of multilateration in this documentation. So multilateration is basically um, sort of the opposite of, of triangulation. You have a signal being broadcast from a location, your plane, picked up by multiple base stations. Based on the differences of time between those, you can actually build an arc as to where that uh, uh, signal came from. You get three stations, you're able to draw three arcs. Where they intersect, that's where your plane is. But there's nothing that I've found that says that this is actually mandatory. <coughs> the systems are being set up in North America. The company that's implementing them is saying, yes, our systems are capable of doing this. You know, we've, we've built it in because it's essentially the same radio. It's, it's you know, nothing fancy there. But there's nothing mandating that airports use this. It may be buried somewhere, but you'd think something, you know, information like that you'd want kind of out front and important. What about jamming? You know, it happens, radio misconfigured, something like that, starts broadcasting on 1090 megahertz. Um, could you sit outside an airport and jam their ability to uh, receive flights? Quite possibly. It already happens, he says. Um, you know, purely by accident or malicious intent, who knows. You could detect these, uh, direction find these fairly quickly, multilateration, um, you know, roll out some trucks to, uh, you know, FCC trucks or whatever to, to try, uh, try and find this stuff. But does every airport have this capability? If I did it for 10 minutes and then moved, did it, you know, another, an hour later did it for another 10 minutes, are they going to roll the trucks for that? I don't know. What plans do they have? If you target a, a particular location, again, the Olympics. If you could jam London right as all the athletes and VIPs are coming in for an hour, imagine the amount of chaos. Coordinate jamming across multiple travel hubs. Like I said, you've seen what weather will do along the east coast of the U.S. during a major holiday. Introduce, you know, a bit of noise. It could be just a pelican case that you just, like, magnet to the side of a, a, a receiving station. Something's going to happen. I don't know. ADSB doesn't have a contention protocol. It's just a simple broadcast. So if you get too many planes in the same area, the system falls apart because there's just so much noise. No, you can't get the, the uh, signal through the noise. You can augment this artificially, maybe. I don't know. Let's look at ADSB in. So this is plane to plane and air traffic control into the plane. You could inject confusing, impossible, scary types of data to elicit a response. 
you know, you've got a, a flight that's been flying cross country for a few hours. You know, a pilot's a little tired or whatever. You inject something on his traffic display that suddenly says, yeah, there's a plane 500 yards in front of you. I don't know, something's gonna happen. <laughs> Probably something involving a sphincter. <laughs> yeah. 500 miles an hour, you can still brown your shorts. You could introduce conflicting data between air traffic control and the cockpit. Air traffic control says, oh, everything ahead of you is clear. No, according to my display, there's a conga line in front of me. What's going on? Because the aircraft have no source of multilateration. They don't know where this, they have no way of correlating where this signal is coming from. They just get GPS coordinates, that's it. They can't verify which, where that signal is coming from. This is only used for a traffic display. So this is just a, you know, sort of a nice to have. It's not as important as other systems, but we'll, we'll get to those. GPS jamming. The whole source of this thing is GPS locating. You, know, you want a really accurate signal. Um, North Korea is currently running GPS jamming along their borders. So it's already, already happening. The UK ran a, a bunch of tests along their uh, highways where they had listening posts listening for uh, rogue signals on GPS frequencies and found a whole bunch of them over a couple of weeks. Usually trucks mounted with uh, uh, jammers so that you know, they're low jacks so that they're, the boss knows that you're where you are at any time. You know, some guy would just plug this thing into a cigarette lighter to jam that so the boss couldn't track him. Uh, Newark Airport in New Jersey actually had a situation with this. Um, on a regular basis, they would get a whole bunch of GPS interference at the same time every day in the same location. They couldn't figure it out. They finally knew, okay, it's a regular basis, we're able to track this down, we'll go out there, we'll, we'll camp out with direction finding gear and figure this out. What it was was a delivery truck driver whose boss had lowjacked his vehicle so that, you know, keep, tra keep tabs on him. The guy'd plug in this uh, uh, cigarette lighter GPS jammer and then take a nap. And he would park right at the end of the runway in the parking lot. <laughs> and was jamming the friggin' airport. These things are only like 20 or $30 on Deal Extreme, so it's not like they're hard to get. Who's a fan of Deal Extreme? All right. <laughs> All the crap that you should never buy. Is anybody actually able to order stuff from there that costs less than $100 for the whole order? You go there for a $3 cable and it's like you know, $150 later. But these sort of things can be tucked into baggage. You know, could be sitting on a timer. Okay, what's your fallback position now? You know, we jam GPS for the entirety of the flight. Um, all the advantages of ADS-B suddenly go out the window. And if you've now disabled a bunch of the original primary stuff, Okay, what do we do now? Um, <laughs> I don't know, something's gonna happen. GPS spoofing. We manipulate the signals from GPS satellites to say, oh, you're at a different latitude and longitude. The aircraft tr location tracking is no longer reliable. Okay, best case, we fall back to traditional navigation ads, get rid of some of the advantages of ADS-B. Worst case, such as if you're flying through a mountain, uh, Mountain Valley in Alaska, um, yeah, you intersect something that's a lot bigger than you, and that would be bad. Iran may have used this technique to bring down a U.S. drone uh, earlier in the year. Uh, that one I don't think we'll ever actually get a complete answer as to what happened, but uh, still, it's interesting to consider. And uh, there's just that university team just uh, this past month that was able to take over a uh, U.S. military drone um, and guide it by just spoofing GPS. You know, it's for like less than a thousand dollars worth of stuff. So this stuff is capable of being done right now. Some threats are total unknowns. I don't know. The ATR air traffic control system is huge. The stacks and stacks of, of documents that are out there and publicly available. Because so many systems interact with each other in weird ways. I can't understand all this. Like these guys, I have serious respect for that any of this works at all. But things like, okay, so all these ground stations are, are networked together. Could I be sitting on the west coast and inject something that shows up on the east coast? Yeah. I'm sitting on the west coast, but my GPS that I'm injecting says east coast. I don't know. I'd like to find out. Honestly, has anyone actually sat down and fuzzed a 747 or an air traffic control tower? 
There's data going in and out of there. Yeah, there's checksums and everything like that, but what happens when you just start spewing random weird crap at it? How does it deal with that? I don't know. We've got very mature pro you know, networking protocols that still fail massively with basic fuzzing techniques. Look into, is Chris Roberts in the audience? No? Okay. Chris Roberts, One World Labs. This man scares the hell out of me. Not just because he's in a kilt. His work, basically, he, he does stuff with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the onboard Wi-Fi on a plane, breaking that and then finding an interconnection between that and the engine control system. So to where he's looking at the output of the IntelliBus network for the engine that's outside his window while in flight. Look up his stuff. It is terrifying, the stuff that he has found. And then add all this ADSB stuff into it. From also from his work, how do you know that the chip level code that is being used in these implementations is actually what was originally submitted? A lot of the stuff's made in China. We're already finding situations where the code that's in the chip may not be exactly what was supposed to be there. Could this be used as a control channel? We now have data going in and out in a clear text fashion. If we have a, a particular you know, change in the checksum or, or some you know, mangle the pack in a certain way, could we now use this for controlling onboard malware on a plane? You hope that the engineers, the FAA, DHS, everybody else looked into these threats. But I actually had a, a, an interesting conversation yesterday where it was pointed out they're safety engineers. They're trying to get a plane from A to B operating under certain circumstances as safely as possible. Human life, you know, the material uh, cost of the equipment. They're not security engineers. They're not thinking, what if somebody decides to go do something completely random or horrible? What happens? Okay, they're thinking, oh, if we fly through an area where there's some random interference, that's fine. But what about targeted, intelligent, slight manipulations of data? This isn't their normal operating thing. This is new to them. Not for us, though. We're sort of the opposite. You know, they're, they're safety engineers. We're security engineers. They're used to thinking about getting things safely and not thinking about security. We're used to thinking about security, definitely not safety. <laughs> Says the guy with a bottle of crystal head here. So the FAA submitted their ADSB implementation idea to NIST, National Institute for Science and Technology, for security certification. Great, cool. Somebody else, independent verification. But in this one document I found said, the FAA specifically assessed the vulnerability risk of ADSB broadcast messages being used to target air carrier aircraft. This assessment contains sensitive security information and is controlled under 49 CFR parts one and blah, blah, blah and its content is otherwise protected from public disclosure. It gets worse. Well, the agency cannot comment on the data in this study, it can't confirm the purposes of responding that the comments in this rulemaking proceeding that using ADSB data does not subject any aircraft to any increased risk compared to the risk that it is experienced today. <laughs> this is comforting. <laughs> yes, we submitted it for security evaluation. We can't tell you if it was crap or not. What threats were they testing against? Did they think of everything? Maybe there's somebody in this room who could think of something else that I haven't, or that they haven't. Why not threats of tomorrow? Yeah. So how do we mitigate some of this? Multilateration is an obvious one. Time differential between signals, you can approximate the location of where that signal is coming from. But if you're relying on this, then what's the point of putting GPS and everything on the planes so that they know where things are? You, know, you, you just nullified all of your advantages. No indication that this is being used everywhere. What about if the data doesn't match? If I'm able to introduce, you know, have multiple uh, locations and potentially spoof ADSB or, or spoof uh, the multilateration signal, if I'm saying that there are two planes, same tail number and everything like that at two different locations, how is the UI of the air traffic control system, you know, how does this re represent it? What are the liabilities if I decide, oh, this one's probably fake, I'm just going to not show it. 
but it's the real one. The response to most inquiries I've seen are, trust us. Yeah, no. Last time I ran into the language from that uh, uh, NIST test was uh, RFID passports the US was looking at implementing. That turned out well, didn't it? Yes, we submitted this to NIST, but we can't tell you what the results were. I'm not trying to spread a bunch of FUD here. I'm trying to raise some awareness and pressure. I know that there are people from the FAA in the uh, audience at the moment. I want to work with them. You know, I want to find out that this stuff is safe. I fly home in a couple of days. I want to know that this is safe. I want to know what their procedures are. How do the air traffic controllers deal with weird crap? I have 50 extra planes on my display. What do I do? I don't know. Saying to a room of 2,500 hackers that they're suddenly now interested in air traffic control systems, will they elicit a response? And if that response is me getting arrested, at least I'm going to have a very nice looking mugshot. <laughs> a common response is also going to be, oh, but it's too expensive for the common man. A $20 USB TV adapter can be modified to do basic ADSB reception. Currently, working with Dragorn, trying to get him to uh, implement uh, ADSB in tracking with uh, Kismet Nucor, so we can go war driving for airplanes. <laughs> I got word while in the air en route to Poland that Nick Foster had actually implemented ADSB out through GNU Radio. You can see we actually have a valid packets, you know, able to go out through GNU Radio. The honeymoon's over. Exploit number one is here. We have the potential now to putting data into the air. You know, a new radio plot for a, a MODES uh, extended squirter packet. He also raised his game and impressed the hell out of me. He basically took ADSB in on flight gear, the open source flight simulator, populate, basically had one radio receiving real world ADSB packets, populate the virtual world of the flight simulator, and also has another radio <laughs> that outputs from your little Cessna out to the real world. So, got a little video here. You can see on the, my right, uh, Google Earth display, that is the output from the real uh, ADSB receiver, the real world tracking the virtual plane there, and at the bottom is the ADSB data stream out. Now this is done under very controlled conditions, basically dummy load, you know, two radios connected to each other. It wasn't actually put out into the air. But, as you can see, so just to explain what's going on here, you see, okay, you've got real planes there, VDR, you know, 211, everything. Those are the real flights. Your mom is not the real flight. <laughs> Your mom may be as big as a 747, but you know, that's not her. And you see, it's got you know, valid packets, valid information. And I'm not sh I can't tell if it's showing up on the displays or not. Um, OK, so it is. You can see the flight path as he's uh, turning around there over the bay. So we're generating packets that if you put this in front of air traffic control would show up on their display. Now, does anybody think that's a good idea? <laughs> um, what is he doing? Uh, okay, is he about to buzz the tower? <laughs> really? Okay. I, it's coming right for us! Yeah, so if I was air traffic control right now, I, um, how fast would I be running? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, fortunately all this is done in a closed environment by trained professionals. Um, but yeah, you can kind of get the idea that this isn't a good thing. And if he, uh, if he pans around at the moment here, and 
you can actually see the flight path that it took. You know, if you saw that on a radar scope, oh my god. Yeah, there you go, you can see it spun around, come around. All right. That shit's over. Come on. Oh, there it is. Okay. So we have the capability of uh, generating arbitrary packets. I basically prodded Nick a little bit about this. He had thought to do it. it. Took him, you know, a weekend. Anybody can do this. All the major testing was done at the 900 megahertz ISM band. It would not be difficult to uh, adjust this. You can use UAT ADSB as well. The nice guys who do this might not be so nice. There are other things in air traffic control that scare me. Tailored arrival, where air traffic uploads a flight plan for landing to where they basically, pilot receives it, pushes a button, plane pretty much lands itself. Apparently this is also unencrypted, unauthenticated. <laughs> Haven't looked into it, I can't confirm, don't call me on that. But the air traffic control system is huge and complex. Reading one si about one system leads you into a whole bunch of others. It's all tightly integrated. This will be mandatory by 2020. This will be the primary method of air traffic control. It's already used all over the world. There are still time to develop countermeasures, like not turning off primary, primary radar. Um, basically, if anybody has a 747 or an air traffic control tower that we can borrow, uh, let me know after the talk. I promise to return it in as good condition as I, I take it from you. Uh, but also, if you have access just to the avionics, we'd love to actually test this stuff for real. We want to find out. There's some suggested reading, a few documents I found particularly interesting, but there's a lot of information out there. And this is a very stu scary stuff to consider. Who's thinking about taking the bus home? <laughs> we should be working on finding and solving these sort of problems. If guys like me can find this stuff, so can bad guys. Significant investment, billions of dollars has already been invested into this system. I want to hear your comments. I want to hear your ideas. I want to work together and research this stuff. But wait, there's more. Nick, get up here. So this is Nick Foster. This is the badass behind the video. And this afternoon he was telling me about something he just figured out. So I figured out uh, after a night of heavy drinking last night, um, first of all, just to say, this is like shooting fish in a barrel. If you're not scared about this, you should be. This is really easy to do without encryption, without any thought of security in the protocol. Uh, it's just not hard. So there's a collision avoidance system called TCAS that predates ADSB. It's called Traffic Collision Avoidance System. It's how airplanes keep themselves away from each other. Uh, it operates on the same mode S data link that ADSB uses. Uh, ADSB doesn't supplant it. It uh, works with TCAS. TCAS is how airplanes avoid hitting each other. ADSB is how airplanes know where each other are outside of that. So it replies on this uh, cooperative ranging system. It's like a, a ping pong. Uh, and it's slaved directly to the pilot. The pilot can see uh, TCAS reports. If there's a plane nearby that TCAS says uh, you should watch out for, it's going to show up on the pilot screen. If it can be spoofed, this is bad. Now the pilot is seeing false information. Uh, it gets worse. On Airbus and Eurocopter aircraft, it's actually tied in to the autopilot. So if the flight director is turned on and TCAS says, hey, somebody's coming up close to you, the autopilot is going to take corrective action. <laughs> really? <laughs> Sounds bad. This is bad. So TCAS, in normal operation, uh, the interrogator sends out a ping. It gets a reply back. Okay, it does a little bit of math. It figures out how far the plane is. What's key to this is that there's a fixed 128 microsecond turnaround time that TCAS has in the protocol that gives the electronics time to gather a response and then transmit it. Well, I don't need 128 microseconds. What if you're not cooperative? If you send out a reply sooner, if you, can, if you can get a reply out sooner, say you can do it in 70 microseconds, 
Now you can fake your distance from the aircraft much closer. You can create essentially an arbitrary range to the aircraft. Uh, altitude is encoded in the reply, so you can create a synthetic arbitrary altitude that happens to match the aircraft's altitude. That's it. You can create a, a range track, a collision course between two aircraft, one of which doesn't exist, that's slaved into the autopilot. So that's what we just figured out last night. I'll turn it back to you. Right. Thank you. So um, do we have time for questions? No. Uh, OK, I think I know who you are, so no? All right. Uh, we, uh, so apparently Kaminsky actually supplanted me out of the uh, Q&A room. So it's actually going to be in the hallway outside the Q&A rooms. So out this door, down the hall, left, down there, look for me. Uh, I'll hang out as long as it takes to, to answer questions. Uh, Nick will be here. Thank you, Nick. Thank you to the EFF. Uh, please talk to us about this stuff. Communicate. Thank you.